clear? Sure, ma'am. Okay. So, two people, three people waiting. We'll admit them all. Lovely. Hello, Mr. Saraugi. Good evening. So on behalf of the library subcommittee, a very warm welcome to the Bengal Club, Calcutta's book club. I'm Julie Banerjee Mehta, for those of us uh, who haven't met before from the University of Toronto. And uh, currently I'm a professor at postgraduate English Loreto College, Kolkata, my uh, alma mater. It's a privilege uh, to anchor and curate this club's great initiative. For our November 2020 book club, I selected Disgrace by J.M. Quidzia, the South African Nobel Prize awardee for literature in 2003, because this novel written in uh, 1999 still resonates. And I think it's not only because of the horrific instance of rape, which is the front and center of 90% of the rapes that take place in the world take place in India. That's a, you know, that's, that's a formidable uh, number. But it is also a novel that deals with the appalling issues of race, with Black Lives Matter uh, coming back with full swing and thrusting into our lives from as far away as the US and most propitiously, we are discussing the issue of Black Lives Matter on a day when America is facing an election which has these binaries of white and black pitted against each other. So it's a troubling story. It's a violent story. And it's a compelling story with a multi-dimensional, multi-perspective, multi-layered approach that has earned it the honor or dishonor of being the most disturbing tale written in the 21st century the cusp of the 21st century would be more correct, I think. But it is so textured and it is so across the disciplines that it could very well feature on the syllabi of economics to history, to international affairs, to uh, developmental issues, to management and geography, social sciences, not to mention literature. The plot is a very simple plot, actually. It's about a professor, David Lurie, who is the protagonist. He's a professor who disgraces himself by foisting himself on a student, an underage Melanie, married several times and a sexual predator who envisages his white DNA as a kind of stamp that allows him any woman that he wants to possess. He has no guilt and no grace to take responsibility for his actions. He needs the constant approbation and the approval of having conquered the body space of a woman as a South African white, terminated from Cape Town University for his sexual harassment act. He goes to live for a while, he thinks, with his daughter, Lucy, up in the Veld in Northern South Africa. Lucy happens to be gay. And that is a double whammy when she is raped by four black men who also attempt to kill Lurie with kerosene and light a fire. The novel is about possession. It is about apartheid, it is about unmitigated violence, but although it is undergirded by Mandela's Truth and Reconciliation Commission legislation, Lucy, the 
victim of rape shows herself with a transformation of not being a victim, but somebody who makes her own decisions about the history of South Africa. Her bodyscape becomes the bodyscape of the South African nation. And Lucy reacts to the rape as a kind of superhuman resilience, with a kind of superhuman resilience and understanding of the history of white settler dominance. David Lurie calls himself a monster, and that is up to the reader to decide. Along the narrative, his expiation comes with his act of putting stray dogs and those who are challenged animals to eternal peace. The novel does not give us any easy answers because there are none, but it makes us come out of our comfort zone, come out of our intellectual aspirations of giving explanations which will stick because nothing really sticks about this novel. What does stick is the contestation, the discomfort, and the invocation of what is justice. Does legislation necessarily amount to justifying or to punishing those who have breached the line of humanity? And the answer seems to lie in the word no. As Lucy affirms again and again, it is about how we treat each other, how we look at each other beyond the legal norm. Lucy's answer to the rape is that she becomes the representation of a kind of debt that is owed by white, that is owed by white South Africans for 400 years, for generations past, in her bodyscape. So she feels in some way that she will not go to the police. She will not take any action legally because this is her body space which will expiate the crime of her ancestors. So without further ado, the trajectory that we'll be following today, I think, will be the same as last time on our launch, which is we have a lineup of scintillating members today, uh, about 12 or 13 of them who will present their responses to the novel, about three minutes each. And then I will open it up to the floor with all our attendees from all over um, the planet. Uh, and I'm really grateful for people who've woken up early to give us their views um, across the ponds on this novel, which is so appropriate for our times. So without further ado, may I request Mr. Gurudash uh, Mitro, our techie wizard, to please play the trailer of the film so that we are all on the same page and we can uh, start our discussion. Thank you, Gurudash. I haven't heard from my daughter, still on the farm. She thinks it's safer. How's work? They look through me when I speak, forget my name. Now, let me tell you, everyone already knows about this latest affair of yours. Really? The story is she took sleeping pills. We want to give you a chance to state your position. I'm guilty. Pass sentence and let us get on with our lives. Make Gloria them do a brilliant career. I always forget how far away you live. Petrus, this is my father. I'm anxious about my daughter alone. So isolated. Everything dangerous today. Oh, 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 oh. 
Miss Van Grahamstown, very quiet. This is done out of the way of temptation. Desire is a burden we could well do without. Should we be nervous? What do you want? Lucy! Let me call the police. You don't know what happened. This is my life! I'm the one who has to live here! Petrus is with them! I know you! We will kill you! What kind of creature is this Lucifer? For though he lives among us, Hi. he is not one of us. When you trap a woman, it must be a bit like killing. You're a man. You should know. Professor Lurie, you can't run away. Condemned to solitude. He is what he calls himself, a monster. Thank you, Gurudash. Can we go on to the slides very quickly? Hi, Gurudash. Can we go on to the yes, slides? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. Thank you, dear. The other day. No, no, not this one. The slides. PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you so much. So just wanted to put us all on the same page. It was published in 2003 and it reflects um, Reconciliation Report, the Truth and Reconciliation Report. And what I would like to draw your attention to is that it contemplates a mode of interpersonal solidarity as an alternative to the rights paradigm. And this is the point that I think uh, Lucy makes very evident in her reading of the rape. Okay, uh, Gurudash, the next one. I want to uh, just read this out to you, where Lucy says, Petrus is not offering me, one of, one of the black guys who is, wants to become her landowner, is not offering me a church wedding followed by a honeymoon on the wild coast. He's offering an alliance, a deal. I contribute the land in return for which I'm allowed to creep in under his wing. So he's a protector. Otherwise, he wants to remind me I'm without protection. I'm fair game. If he wants me yeah. to be known as his yeah, Nina. as his wife, that's fine. But then the child becomes huh? his... Please mute yourselves. Sorry. As for the land, say I will sign the land over to him as long as the house remains mine. I will become a tenant on his land. It is humiliating. That is what I must learn to accept, to start at ground level with nothing, not with nothing, but with nothing. No cards, no weapons, no property, no rights, no dignity, like a dog. So this is the essence which we as readers unveil, unpackage, and try to understand. Thank you, Gurudash. We go on to our speakers now. Choitali, are you there? Dr. Choitali Moitro, you're yes, there? Yes, okay, yes. Okay, wonderful. So, um, Choitali is an articulate, insightful teacher and a scholar of English literature, a member of our library subcommittee at the Bengal Club. And I must say some of the best explications I've heard in my time are by Choitali. So please do enjoy and um, all, all at your door, Choitali, go ahead. Hi, Shudha. Good evening. 
thank you julie di thank you for such kind words i would just like to say that uh, after finishing this novel uh my thought was not a continuous one and gradually the helplessness of luri his pain his disgrace started haunting me and uh, unbeknownst my reading became layered you understand at least i understood that after quite some time so if i try and give you certain sort of motives a few motives at least which sort of explains these layers some would be uh, the professor of romantic literature trying to teach communicative skills the second would be twice divorced the third would be his attachment to soraya the quality of his attachment with the word family please then seducing a secretary then the relationship with melanie and finally dismissed as a teacher i'm just trying to talk about motives not a trajectory and other aspects of uh, physicality which keep getting established i felt that somewhere there is a fragmented existence of luri and somewhere there is a lack of fulfillment so as we keep thinking about the novel it makes you think after the first reading that is i think the first success first bit of success so he's blindly pursuing too many relationships and uh, also showing a big bit of intellectual arrogance also suggests of questions maybe i'm using a harsh phrase maybe a spiritual hollow the author doesn't talk about the spiritual hollow it could be not should but it could be one of the subtexts and uh, just to remind in in the text animal images abound there is a sort of phrase talking about the jaws of a fox closing on the neck of a rabbit and luri compares himself to a dog so these many many animal uh, like references do try to reinforce a question if you think of the backdrop of the kantian ethics and of course the presidency of mbeki of, of course the changing conditions of south america south africa at that time you do feel that the categorical imperative is decidedly undermined so that is my take from the novel where does man stand and to what extent does the political situation help him to find out a better mind that he could possess thank you brilliant on point as usual thank you choitali we'll come back to the animal images because as you and i both know uh you know his novel um the life and times of michael k uh and his other work as well tries very hard uh to deconstruct the natural environment which had affected and affected him both thanks so much let's move i think you you are muted julie uh brilliant as usual and on point choitali uh we will come back to images of uh animals in uh the text towards the end i think they'll have the other people so i'm looking for harish harish mehta are you there please unmute yourself okay hello award winning historian specializing in american foreign policy and human rights a professor at mcmaster university which is his alma mater and an author of many books on cambodia and a recent one on vietnam harish is i think uh, pretty well qualified to speak about the idea of the economics of land and land rights which i hope he will be speaking about he is also the editor in chief of the rising asia journal so go ahead harish well thank you very much julie and um, 
uh, and good evening to all the members. Um, so uh, it was, I think, a year after South Africa began its uh, process of uh, dealing with uh, apartheid, at the end of apartheid, uh, they had a policy of truth and reconciliation. A commission was started. And then as part of all that, uh, South Africa began a major land reform program. And uh, a year or so after the land reform program started, uh, the author, Kodzia, uh, uh, says that his new novel, Disgrace, at the heart of the novel is the failure of the land reform project. So when uh, uh, um, Petrus, the man who used to work on the farm, makes an offer to uh, the white woman who is actually the owner of the farm, that the rights will be going from her to him informally, that act, that act of the transference of rights, in a sense, nutshells the entire failure of South Africa's land reform project. Because land reform didn't succeed in transferring land to the blacks who had been denied their own land by the forcible occupation of their lands historically by the white settlers, because that project had failed, you have a situation, a fictionalized one, where Kotsia is using a historical failure and turning it into a fictional account of what the failure of land reform really means. It means that the blacks who are on the land will overthrow in an act of rebellion the whites that are still on that land. And they will do this, in some cases, in a genteel or a sexual manner, where they will offer the woman that she becomes a third wife, and then but the land then will belong to Petrus. Or in other cases, uh, they will bomb it, they'll kill them, they will use the guns to get rid of uh, the white set. So the, the fate of the land reform program was pretty, uh, you know, they had a three-pronged land reform program. Uh, and the, it's still continuing, by the way, and uh, it's been on for over, what, two decades, and uh, a, a part of it was, the first part of it was restitution, the restoration, which meant uh, people would, you know, happily give the land, but that wouldn't happen, that didn't happen. And then the second leg of the program was uh, uh, called the redistribution. Redistribution meant that the government of South Africa would find willing buyers among the whites, and then the government would pool together funds to buy land from willing buyers at not inflated prices, but at reasonable prices. And then that land would be transferred to the blacks. So uh, that failed abysmally because uh, many of these whites who owned the land had actually never even seen the land. They lived in the cities, but they had, they had such huge land holdings far away that they didn't even bother to go and check out what the land was like. So the, pro the project failed purely because of a lack of uh, a commercially viable program. There wasn't a mechanism. So that's fallen apart. A and uh, but the government has money and they're still trying to soldier on with it. And uh, uh, so while all that is happening, uh, there are very definitive, there are over 50 odd claims by tribes with very definitive you know, mark, marked areas that they say is, belongs to them. So, so that issue is still continuing alongside. So this again, uh, so this kind of thing, uh, you know, it falls uh, very neatly into Kotzia's lap. This mapping of uh, the the failure of the entire project of land reforms, and then he takes it to look at 
property. Uh, and then the many, many variations of his take on what property meant. The exercise of white prerogative over the white, uh, over the white woman, the, 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 the black woman, the in-between brown woman. It was all about property and, you know, hegemony. So it was all about the novel is about various forms of hegemonies that have continued after apartheid, because after, you know apartheid, you can't just say, okay, we, we we legislate and you guys are all reformed whites now. That wasn't going to happen. And therefore, you had uh, a situation where the, the 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 apartheid and its continuing ev evolution. And the forms it continues to take, and the hegemonies that were rooted in apartheid, and how those hegemonies exist in the Kotsia novel. Thanks so much, Arish. Yeah, that was wonderful. You. Thank you. The next person we have is Dr. Aparna Hastagir, a member of our uh, subcommittee. She graduated from Presidency College and holds a PhD from King's College London, lectured in Jadavpur University, several places in Calcutta, several colleges. But what I find very interesting is that she has turned this into this vision, this large world education into becoming a founder director of ACE, Inspire, and AJ, AGK, Apollo Medical Skills. So her abilities and skills of understanding the world through literature is now being uh, propagated into medicine. Aparna, all yours. The floor is yours. Thank you, Julie, for this very generous introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm uh, very briefly going to touch upon uh, the power dynamics, which I find uh, is, is present here in this fiction, which is great. Um, I feel uh, Kutsi here scrutinizes uh, the nature of human desire by specifically looking at the relationships between power and uh, sexual yearnings. And Bikis disgrace is uh, partly about a 52-year-old professor who uh, loses his job after sleeping with one of his students. It is impossible to ignore this power dynamics. <clears throat> and this uh, professor uses his elevated position, uh, being a white, to manipulate a 20-year-old Melanie into having sex with him. And uh, this is very disturbing. Uh, this thirst for power is, is present in all of his uh, sexual relationships because he seems to think that each and every one of the women with whom he has uh, a physical relationship is somehow inferior to him. And in the end, ironically, he's the one who's left jobless, emotionally unsupported, and widely disrespected in society. And uh, Therefore, this proves that he was wrong in, in uh, thinking himself to be more powerful uh, and, and superior uh, than the woman he sleeps around with. Uh, you know, he approaches sexual uh, relationships or any kind of romantic relationship with an objectifying attitude, which to me appears to be very selfish. And this is exactly what leads to his loneliness and despair in the end, and not power. Uh, pardon me, uh, you know, if I cannot help thinking of the similarity between the protagonist's surname Luri and Lurid. Honestly speaking, I'm yet to come across a more deplorable protagonist than this professor. Uh, David's appetite for power, you know, uh, in the context of the sex is made uh, very clear in the first chapter when, uh, you know, he visits the prostitute called Soraya. He thinks he's in a position of dominance and uh, because he's paying Soraya to get whatever he wants. And he even unburdens himself to him on occasions, to her on occasions. Uh, but however, 
sadly enough, he fails to recognize that there are ways in which Soraya actually has power over him. Uh, because after all, she is providing him with a service which can be and is eventually revoked. Uh, because she guards her private life in a way that makes her less vulnerable than, you know, uh, the protagonist himself. And uh, the moment David tries to pry into her private life, the service is revoked. And in much the same way, uh, Lurie's relationship with Melanie has a far-reaching consequence. Now, this is something which is unimaginable to Lurie. To, to him, Melanie is just another trophy or an object uh, possessed due to his position of power. And he, as Julie had mentioned uh, before, at the very beginning of this program, he refuses to take moral responsibility for his actions, which comes off as very, very selfish. But ironically enough, Melanie refuses to be marginalized. She refuses to be pushed to the margins. Uh, she shows that she is much more than uh, Lurie's student and has a life beyond his desire. Uh, and here, strangely, you know, I can't help thinking of, of Caliban uh, in Tempest, who talks back to Miranda when she accuses him, I pitied D, and took pains to, uh, uh, you know, uh, teach the, to make D speak. And uh, Caliban perfectly replies, uh, well, you taught me language, and my profit on it is that I know how to curse. Uh, I'm saying this because, you know, sexual power dynamics in this play are really black and white. There's a huge, huge gray area in this fiction. And at least here, I feel the colonized or the marginalized gives it back to their colonizers or the whites. And uh, a very, uh, another pertinent thing to note on, I feel, is the ambivalence towards rape. Uh, the surprising degree of suspicion, you know, with which the victims, red victims are treated, it shows that in matters of chastity, archaic uh, attitudes like honor and shame are still far from dead. And the modern justice system based on the notions instead of the guilty and the innocent has not been able to fully replace the outmoded attitude. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you have... Okay, you wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up. Say what you have to say about uh, uh, No, this is basically, I want to draw a parallel between Lucy's rape and Melanie's rape and finish it off there. Uh, you know, we, we know colonization is, you know, the, the, there's this propagation of myth of territories, you know, conquering territories as virgin land. But Kelsey shows that it's actually the violence which is literally inflicted on the bodies. And while the rape of Lucy is, is shown as rape, the rape of Melanie is not shown as rape, it's just shown as sexual harassment. Yes. That is all that's, I wanted to end with. That's an excellent point. point. That's an excellent point we'll pick up on. Uh, how we perceive rape when it's uh, a performative act by a white person vis-a-vis -vis a black person. Yes, and therefore David is not shown as being arrested. Uh, arresting yes. David is not an option in the play. Yeah. yeah. Good, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Uh, Dr. Parumita Mukherjee, Malik, such a pleasure to have you on board. A stellar, stellar poet transformed from a scientist to a poet. She conceptualized and is the president of the Mumbai chapter of the Intercultural Poetry and Performance Library. Six books of poetry under your belt, my goodness. Bevy of awards. Go for it. We are looking forward to your take. Thank you so much, Julie D. It's a pleasure to be here. Pardon me, I'm not so qualified to talk about a book. I'm not a basic literature person. So I see this book in a different level where I saw that there was these two, three layers of disgrace. Initially, David Lurie being disgraced by his sinful act or whatever, very bad act, of course. And then the disgrace of his daughter, Lucy. But I find, I always, I'm a very optimist, a hardcore optimist. I try to find, and a poet, of course, and I try to find positivities. I try to find aspects of redemption. A man or a woman cannot be totally bad, totally, you know, thrown into the dustbin or garbage bin because he's bad. So, you know, I find it very refreshing when there is an aspect of redemption for David Lurie. 
when he comes to this uh, Bev show and he helps in, you know, giving solace to the dying dogs. I find it very solacing. I find it very beautiful that a man is totally not thrown into the garbage. He still has a silver lining hidden in him. That is what really helped me because I cannot read a poetry which is very negative. I cannot read a book which is negative. I'm always finding for something, some redemption, you know, to that person. So I find David Lurie a very human, a holistic human person who has human values as well as monster values. Where when he meets Soraya, he says that your secret is safe with me. When he has seen her, her with his her two sons, and then they meet again, you know, he still you know, tries to keep the secret. That's the human aspect of him. Again, there is a again the author gives us a very human touch when he is burned with kerosene, and Bill Shaw, the husband of Bev Shaw, helps him out and takes him to the doctor. And he says, I'm your friend. And he asks us readers, the protagonist re asks us readers, so can a person just having a cup of tea be a friend? I just loved that part. I just loved that part. Yes, a person can be a friend just by having a cup of tea or coffee with you. You know, these things, these things made me the happy uh, optimist that I am, help to read the whole book. And the last part where they show that, you know, these dogs were being killed by Bev Shaw, of course, the handicapped dogs, or of course, proliferating dogs, where the last dog he wanted to keep back for a week, he wanted, he was very attached to the dog. And Bev Shaw says, no, it's finished. The, the, the killing of dogs is finished for a day. Didn't you want the dog for you? And that last line, I think, shows that there is always some good in every bad that happens in this world. Thank you. What a wonderful <laughs> reading of disgrace. I have never heard something like this so positive and so full of hope. Thank you. We need those words, Paramita. And I have a short clip, if we have time, from his Nobel Prize winning speech. You can see that he was a very compassionate writer and it resonates with what you're saying. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. It is my great pleasure to call upon Professor Otish Mitro, a mathematician, a physicist based at uh, Montana Tech University at Montana. He is a South Pointer and a Calcutta boy. And his visit to South Africa, which he was talking to some of us at our Google Meet informally a few days ago is what really got my attention. So he lives between worlds. He lives in Montana and in Calcutta, as many of us do. And um, I'm waiting to hear what he has to say. Thank you, Julie. So what I found uh, particularly unsettling is a way, if I want to pick one particular part of the novel, is the way the daughter, uh, I think her name is Lucy, deals with the rape by the three intruders. At the first, she refuses to go to the police and then slowly things, you see, start uh, coming out in the open. For example, one of the molesters who was a young boy seems to be well known to the neighboring farmer, uh, Petras, the guy who has uh, his eyes on Lucy's land. So even Petras uh, even tells his father eventually that he, wants to marry Lucy. And surprisingly, uh, that is very unsettling. Um, uh, Lucy is not surprised. She sort, uh, sort of is, uh, is resigned to these sort of fates. She says, uh, as, as you showed in the slide, I, I read from uh, the book now, that I contribute the land in return, I'm allowed to creep in under his wing. Otherwise I am without protection, I am fair game. And then she follows by saying, it is maybe it is a good point to start from again with nothing, with absolutely nothing, no prospects, no rights, no dignity, just like a dog. So when I read these things, these as if she's almost describing the plight of the black South Africans during the apartheid, these words, no prospects, no rights, no dignity like a dog. Maybe in her mind in some twisted way, you see, I, I thought she's paying penance for the sins of her ancestors, as you also pointed out. 
So maybe she thinks at one level, restitution and restoration at the government level is good. But even before that comes the sense of expiation as, as a personal level. So this thing at the same time, I found quite disturbing and um, quite striking. I mean, when one goes to South Africa, one sees in a big cities like Johannesburg, for example, the stark difference between the whites, even a college professor who is white lives in a mansion like gated community where the blacks on the other hand lived in this huge, one of the biggest slums I've seen probably. Uh, uh, almost a tourist attraction, it's the Sueto slum. So one doesn't know, at least I'm not qualified to know how to get rid of this huge inequity that exists even to this day between the whites and blacks. So in her mind, maybe she's expiating for her, uh, the sins of her ancestors. That's what I felt. Perfect, on the money and on point about this whole issue of ownership, possession, which keeps coming back from all of you in different ways. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Atish Mitra. Tour de force, Dr. Shongjukta Dashgupto is one of Calcutta University's undoubtedly most brilliant professors. Former Dean, Faculty of Arts at Calcutta University, um, the president, of the Executive Committee, Intercultural Poetry and Performing Library, ICCR, Kolkata, Convener, English Advisory Board, Shaitya Academy, the list goes on. Shongjukta Deep, will you throw some light on disgrace, such a complex novel you've taught? Um, thank you, Julie, for this opportunity. And thank you, Bengal Club. And I have learned so much from the earlier uh, interventions in terms of understanding the novel and I wonder what more can I add to this but I would like to say that as an anti-racist, anti-imperialist, intersectional feminist I find the novel Disgrace to be an incisive and insightful exploration on many levels of what we have been uh, talking about so long and exploration of the many levels of what falling from grace implies emotionally, ethically, and socially from the points of view of location, race, and gender. Rape of the land of, by the colonizer and colonizing the body of Lucy as rape is, a, I think, an important way of not forgetting the havoc the colonizers have always done on the land itself. Because whenever a colonizer enters another country to which they do not belong, it's rape of the land. And therefore, what we, though the white settlers might have different opinions, but even if you remember that when, uh, uh, in Australia, the white settlers uh, just reached, they said, oh, this is terra nullius. There's nobody here. And then they started murdering all the aboriginals. Similarly with the Canadian First Nation, I don't even have to talk about it. Uh, Julie would be able to tell us much more than I will ever be able to, or even understand. Therefore, I think this is a very important novel for us in this day. And at the same time, uh, we are looking at a professor of English and it's quite an embarrassment really for those of us who have made our living by teaching English literature. But David Lurie in one, uh, one particular uh, part of the novel states that more and more he is convinced that English is an unfit medium for the truth of South Africa. I found that another very, very significant um, part of the novel, apart from the rape issue. And of course, David Lurie's objectification of women, his sexual harassment, abuse, and seduction of vulnerable young uh, girls, especially light-skinned, black students 
uh, those of you who are familiar about uh, with the novels of Alice Walker probably mm. will be able to make that jet black, light skinned <laughs> black women. And of course, and the, in the audacious explanation that it gives him enrichment. And the authorial voice there is une uh, unequivocal, I think, in its censure. Because if you notice, I'll just read those two lines where um, Kodzia states as uh, not rape, not quite that, but undesired nevertheless, undesired to the core, as though she had decided to go slack, that is Melanie, die within herself for the duration like a rabbit when the jaws of the fox close on its neck. The next uh, level at which we can look at this novel, as very rightly pointed out again, is the fact that David could not ever have a sense of belonging to the place. And so his daughter says, wake up David, this is the country, this is Africa. And again, interestingly, uh, uh, Lurie, Professor Lurie, if I have to say that, keeps on talking about Byron or Wordsworth in his classes, thinks about Wordsworth all the time. Now Wordsworth has a series of poems called the Lucy poems. And it seems Wordsworth's Lucy is reborn in this uh, South African landscape away from the very anglicized Cape Town in the Eastern Cape side where Lucy wants to make a home for herself. And again, in the text, we find uh, expressions like she has fallen in love with the land. That sense of empathy, passion, a total immersion is the second generation of the white uh, uh, Africans and South Africans, I would rather say. And so the land and the body, and also the ability of the younger generation to make a choice is very, very important for us to once again notice. Because as David is just coming back to his daughter's house, he says, he just looks at the, looks at the, uh, house itself and he feels that this is not the place he belongs. He says, this is Lucy's patch of earth. Is it his earth too? It does not feel like his earth. Despite the time he has spent here, it feels like a foreign land. So we need, I think it is best to remember that disgrace is really addressing some of the major issues of the outsider, intruder, insider dynamics, which probably younger generations are able to blend in with the native communities and the corresponding inability and the contrast of the older generations to do so becomes obvious. It's also again, Alice Walker's novel Meridian might ring a bell. Incidentally, uh, Julie, uh, yeah. can I just point out that Disgrace was published in 1999 as far as my knowledge goes. Yes, it was, it was, yeah. it was. Touche, 1999 published, won, won, the, uh, won the Nobel Prize. Uh, he uh, won Nobel, the Nobel Prize in 2003. Yeah, you're right. 2002 was the Truth Commission, yeah. second Truth Commission. And um, the feeling is that, you know, he was writing about stuff that was very pertinent. So as with the Nobel, as we know, there is certainly a political element. Um, but he was doing the right thing by, by as you said, by yeah. unpackaging the problems. Thank you so much, Shangju uh, Kadi. Um, that was really illuminating and many scores and really hit at the, hit at the core. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I ask uh, the sinners, the lovely duo Urmi and Shomnath, uh, both of them are uh, from a science background. In fact, uh, Urmi, I remember from Jadapur days, she was a chemical engineering student and Shomnath went to Joka. She, he, you know, the couple here today, a very uh, 
impressive uh, provenance, both members of the Bengal club, both from the corporate world and uh, Shomnath went to uh, IIM Joker. So uh, without further ado, uh, please unmute yourselves and do talk a little bit about this phrase. Hi, I'm Urmi. So I would like to talk about the you know contradictions which I felt in the book Disgrace. So I felt there were several contradictions which got manifested in this book Disgrace. Today I will elaborate on three such factors which I came across. Firstly, the dual contradictory character of David Leary himself, a 52-year-old university professor who had no qualms about enjoying his sex life with multiple partners, many of whom, like Soraya and Melanie Isaac, were of the age of his daughter. David justifies his instincts to himself as being a man of his kind. On the other hand, the other character that David portrayed is when he's a caring and protective father. When his daughter Lucy in the mid twenties is raped by the locals on, the farm, on her farmhouse, his paternal love and innate sense of protection swells up. He's filled with anger and anguish. He's willing to slog to any extent on the farm for the sake of Lucy, though he finds the work on the farm laborious, quite painful and disgusting. This shows the contradictory aspects in David himself. The second contradiction which I feel is how David and Lucy perceive life on the farm after the attack. David tried every option and means to send Lucy away from the farm by suggesting Lucy to take a holiday to Holland, to embrace city life, to sell the farm, or to even propose to Petrus to maintain the farm for Lucy. On the contrary, Lucy's mindset was far more reconciliatory. She doesn't want to be an escapist. She wants to find ways and means to adjust with the locals, continue her life on the farm, to the extent she was ready to even toy with the idea of marrying Petrus, giving her prized possession of the small parcel of land she loved as dowry in lieu of buying Petrus's protection. Now, the third contradiction which I see is what is David and Lucy's thought process about the child Lucy's expecting? David still had the mindset of the colonial supremacy. He couldn't conceive how Lucy was thinking of giving birth to a child by the invaders. What would be the child's genetic order was his concern. Lucy, being a Gen Next girl, was far more open, driven by principles and economic considerations. She had no prejudices about giving birth to a child irrespective of color or creed. She wanted the child to be a son of the soil. Now, when we reflect back hundreds of years back, the whites had colonized in South Africa. Lots of wrongs had happened on the natives. Over time, there's been a seething vengeance brewing up amongst the locals against the whites. Lucy wanted to repay the sins done in the past by her forefathers, whereas David still looked at life with the white superiority. In today's day and age, there is an inherent contradiction as to who has colonized whom. Since the whites had arms, they had martial superiority, but the tide has turned. The once vanquished African community have again gained the upper hand. Now the white minority community is having to accommodate to the new social order. Today, the reverse colonization is on the world over. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Urmi, on the money. Okay, Shobhnath, let's hear what you have to say. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. And um, I must say that I'm more comfortable with numbers than with words. But I'll try to do some justice to this opportunity. Thank you, Julie, for giving the same. To me, as I read the novel, it evolves in different layers. And there are several dominant themes that are thrown open to the reader. I would like to pick on one such theme and examine very briefly whether I encountered any parallels in my corporate life with a global technology leader. There are several uh, uh, examples of conflict that are presented in the story. There's the conflict between the races, the white uh, minority race, and the dominant native uh, race, the civilizations, the respective civilizations that they represent, 
the conflict in the mind of the protagonist, David Lurie, the conflict across genders, whether it be the white aggressor on uh, you know, the native girls or a black aggressor on a white girl, and conflict across the social strata. I would like to just pick two examples of conflict and look at that in a little bit in detail, both in the terms of the story and you know, the larger context of the society. And, and the parallel of that in my organization and perhaps you know, across the industry. So if you look at David Lurie as the protagonist of this story, he is someone who believes himself to be superior, enjoying an enhanced social power and a sense of entitlement as it were for the pursuit of his worldly pleasures. It is inconceivable to him that somebody like Petrus who belongs to the uh, the other as the, the native society would even be anywhere close to him in terms of enjoying some of the benefits or for that matter, you know, some sort of a kinship or a, a, a social equivalence. It is completely uh, antithetical to his uh, way of thinking. The circumstances of the story, however, provides a strategic advantage to Petrus, you know, to gain possession of the parcel of land. And he pursues that both resolutely and very astutely. If you look at the, uh, at the how the story ends, is David is forced to seek a new accommodation with someone whom he would inconceivable, he find inconceivable to have some sort of a, a kinship. If you look at the organizational context, uh, since the uh, you know the industrial revolution. You know, the Western powers have used the might of the guns and disease, that's the way I look at it, in order to subjugate, you know, uh, swaths of colonies across the world and establish both military and economic dominance over them. Uh, in my own space, in the technology space, it was probably less uh, severe, but there, I think the context was, you know, the, uh, having the intellectual uh, uh, leadership and, concent and the concentration of that in a few countries, especially the United States. Now, we had an opportunity to see that, you know, with the advent of globalization in the 90s, a lot of that started uh, changing. There, we saw tectonic shifts in the movement of labor pools. And with that, with the management positions that were supporting those labor pools. In my own experience, where I had a ringside seat in moving about 50,000 jobs to the country, I saw that, however difficult, it was much easier to move the, the, the work itself and what I would call the labor positions. It was far more difficult to move the far fewer management positions because it inherently you know, touched upon the power structures and made people very deeply uncomfortable. However, as we have seen over the years, again, there was a sense of accommodation and however, great the, uh, the level of uh, conflict, it had, uh, we had to find middle ground. The second example I would like to take up is that of, uh, you know, a gender conflict. Okay. Uh, I had an opportunity of doing a two-year rotational assignment of director of HR. And in that position, one of the uh, portfolios that I supervised was in the area of employee relations. Right. And, uh, you know, I had a very I would say a pristine view of you know, our organization uh, in terms of you know, a, a huge amount of confidence in the fact that you know, the processes that we had to deal with you know, harassment, particularly sexual harassment that we had in place were effectively very strong. And therefore it was all very nice. But I must say that you know, that opportunity that I had in, on, in this assignment gave me a completely different view of what was really happening in the organization. And just as in this story, you had somebody with a power of position and influence like David, who, you know, who, who misused his position as it were to inflict, uh, I would say, uh, inflict crime on people who were actually on his, his wards within his protection. I actually found the same happening in the organization. It was not necessary that only one gender was kind of the aggressor and one gender was the victim. It was actually both ways. It was not just, you know, like 
maybe the, the Orientals who are the victims and the Western people who are the aggressors. It was not. It was a cross. So it comes back to the deeper human nature and, you know, which per per pervades across. And again, you know, the, the, what was common in all of that was this sense of the predatory instincts uh, demonstrated by the aggressor and the helplessness of the victim and, and also the social stigmatization and the sense of, you know, the, the fear of being called out, which kind of, you know, uh, tended to have, you know, the whole thing kept under the wraps. Okay. So that brought us to a much more definite design of the process. And what is the metrics that, you know, that you could use to ensure whether the process was working smoothly? And I think, you know, if, as I sum up, you know, if I look at it uh, uh, today, the society the, that we live in and the organizations that we work in, the organizations are really a microcosm of the society that we live in. And therefore, what happens in the society around us invariably land up in the organizations that we work in. And it is our ability to understand and engage with these conflicts uh, is helps us, you know, probably, you know, help everybody around us. So that's kind of, you know, my takeaway from the novel and how I relate it to what I experienced in my professional career. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Shomna. Thank you. That was a, 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 a very new perspective, which I think is a good way to look at how the power dynamics work uh, and worked in your HRD experience. So we take, you know, this is what a great novel does. It, any great literature or art makes you think beyond the paradigmatic geography or history of that period or that space. You can link it to pretty much a universality. So thank you so much for that. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, request Mr. Shubrendu Gangupadhyay. Uh, Stella Career, he was president of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India, and he was the company secretary of the Oberoi's flagship um, East India Hotels, if some of you remember that. He was a lecturer in, Cal lecturer in Calcutta University's Commerce Department and the author of a lovely Bengali book, Upanishadir Aloe Bab um, Babsha Babos. I haven't got it right. Um, Upanishadir Aloe uh, Babsha. So, um, Mr. Gongopathai, will you please uh, step in and give us your version? We are a little tight on time because we have a rambunctious audience waiting, but uh, looking forward to, uh, yes. to hearing your views. Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm overwhelmed with the kind of beautiful analysis of the novel by so many erudite speakers. But this is a story of a middle-aged educated gentleman, a member of the so-called civil society, a university professor who has a disastrous married life with a couple of div divorces in the past and going on merrily objectifying women without any uneasy feeling of or pang of conscience as to his conduct. He is David Lurie, the protagonist in Coetzee's novel, Disgrace. Should we call this man a disgrace to society? I cannot help but draw a parallel with certain men of power who has also been accused of objectifying women, including their daughters on several occasions but who are yet to be disgraced. It is expected that education makes a man complete through a process of physical, emotional, intellectual, and ethical integration of his being. The report on the education to be published by UNESCO in 1982 says that even biologically, Human beings are unfinished products. In ordinary man, only 25% of the brain matter is utilized. The process of evolution of the human species in the organic level has reached up to the homo sapiens stage and it has to 
it has to proliferate into what is ideally known as homo mysticus through the process of education. It must ensure that the physical, emotional and intellectual powers of human beings must be tempered with ethical, moral and spiritual strength which already exists in them to make them a complete man. The book explores the inner frustrations and passionless existence in beautiful prose, but the manifestation it takes in objectifying women certainly leaves the reader wanting just desert. This is an incredibly conflicting novel set against the social milieu in post-apartheid South Africa. Quetsi has dealt with the problem of masculinity and male violence in this story and has attempted to bring out the racial implication of this psychic degeneration within the socio-political niche texture of the novel. From the start to the finish, it has been a grossly uncomfortable read. The character of Luri has been portrayed as a polarizing personality whose life revolves around his interactions with women. You all know about the story now and I must tell you that this book has two different segments. The first part dealing with Luri's uh, adventures with, uh, with, with girls and his, uh, and his lifestyle as a professor after his, and after he resigned from this job and went to his daughter's firm house, there was a second subplot moving in, coming into this novel and the readers may feel that they are reading two different novels. The relationship between the father and the daughter was significantly strained as a result of that horrific attack. Each of them dealt with the trauma in different ways. The difference of opinion between the father and daughter gradually increased and the Luri cannot feel the gravity of the, of the incident and can never understand the psychological impact of the att attack on Lucy because of his male chauvinism. Luri was accustomed to violating women and therefore he was unable to imagine the extent of shame that Lucy is feeling after being brutally assaulted by the miscreants. Lucy, Mr. Mangapadha, we'll have to, yes. we'll have to just truncate yes. this a little bit, yeah? Yes. Uh, considering the novel within the political context is even more problematic. Lucy con considers the attack on her as a consequence of racial hatred and has a symbolic significance. The black men are attacking the white establishment for its oppression of their culture for so many years and Lucy is the victim because to them she represents the white oppressive force. Lurie also recognizes the element of retribution in the attack and considers why the black men choose to shoot the dogs that Lucy is looking after in the farm and concludes that these local black people were taught to identify dogs as a token of white oppression and power. The two parts of the novel uh, the, the, the link of these two plots in a diff is a difference in the way that these forms of masculinity manifest themselves, whether that is explicitly violent or more discreetly exploitative. As a white male, Louis has the privilege of manifesting masculine violence uh, in a way that is not possible for the black men involved in the attack. Nevertheless, the both situations in both situations, if the position of power is abused. Quasi takes his readers to a multitude of, of contradictory situations in order to decide what it means to live in a state of disgrace. Hence, herein I found an uncanny similarity of Quasi's disgrace and Taslima Nasrin's Lodja, which also means disgrace. At the end, I must tell you that the message of the story is that any divide be it of caste, creed, gender, complexion, or religion, which fragments the infrangible human entity 
is a matter of disgrace to the sublime nature of mankind. Amrita Shubhutra. Thank you so much. Thank you. Takes it to a spiritual level as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Gangopadhyay. Uh, Shramana, are you here, my dear? Shramana, are you here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Lovely, yes, lovely. Sorry. Okay. This is the youngest participant today. She's um, uh, particularly um, covetable for us because she has a master's in English literature and um, just is a that right? bachelor's. Bachelor's. But you're very interested. You're an avid reader. Uh, I yeah. would like to be one, yes, of course. Okay, so let's hear your views. Okay, so uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so there, as uh, Professor Moitro, in the beginning, she explained that how led it was. And now that everyone mentioned it, I've realized. Um, so I would like to touch upon one point that um, as uh, Miss Mukherjee, uh, Miss Choitali, uh, ma'am, she explained, she like talked about the positive aspects uh, that she enjoyed. There was this one very comic thing I found in the novel and I was truly surprised. Uh, when I felt that all the mentions of Wordsworth and Byron and uh, the other such, uh, the romantic poets, I felt the novel was turning the notions of these romantic ideas on its head. And it was sort of funny to me. And the way he did it, the way Koitvi did it, but I, I actually would want to focus on uh, this one episode in the novel. Uh, it's between David and Lucy, uh, when they were finally, they uttered the word jail, and uh, they got down to discussing what happened. So, what was interesting to me, Gurudash, is the problem on our side? No, ma'am. Uh, she's having a <laughs> bandwidth issue. Okay. So we are very tight on time. So I don't want to waste time. We'll come back. Hello? To... Yes. Yes, go ahead. E Hello? Yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Ma'am, I just lost connection, I think. We can I'll hear just you. I'll continue. Here. So I'll keep, I'll keep it very short. Yes. Uh, so when they're discussing, there's this thing that Lucy tells them. Uh, okay, so Lucy says, um, and David keeps on boasting about the fact that he understands Lucy's plight, and he says that I do know, except uh, she says that you think you understand, but finally you don't, because you can't, and I think this brought about the whole, uh, this point of contention that they have, that he wasn't present, and thus he will never understand, and uh, this shocked him and it frankly shocked me too because I have a very deep connection with my father and I and when she tells him that you're a man you ought to know and it was mentioned in the trailer I think it just snaps their relationship they're no more father and daughter they become man and woman in the world and the politics and the power strata that they are they individually uh, hold in the world is hold, held up in this this episode and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the black lives matter movement i found that uh, the the way david was behaving the fact that he understands and everything i feel this is one of the mistakes and one of the points of outrage in by the uh, minority communities where um, they agree that um, you don't even have to be one of the aggressors like the white supremacists, but even the allies, the quote unquote allies, they and we some sometimes we um, generalize, we gloss over their very individualistic personal experiences as different communities. And I felt that David was doing that. And as a uh, uh, professor uh, Shonjukta, she mentioned uh, Shonjukta Dashgupta, and she mentioned that uh, I had this point actually the English language part. Uh, I found that um, he mentioned it about Petrus, where he found that this one thing that Petrus said, it was, um, it didn't sound right to him and in the context. So 
it, that's when he commented that sometimes the english language just cannot encompass his life and his emotions so i feel these two places that the woman's uh, experience and also the black persons or a colored persons identity can never be um, sufficiently encompassed by or in this construction of a white man's world which we continue to live in and uh, ma'am as you had pointed out about the feminism um, aspect of it i looked it up uh, so the third wave feminism was on at this time and uh, so a lot of points connect uh, helen and lucy's um, gay relationship uh, uh, reproductive rights the whole fact that lucy is trying to assert her right over her child yes. she's going to learn to love the child she says so all these uh, points come up and that they need it uh, but i feel uh, and the third way then said that no matter what happens we will never get out of this male created world white man's world so um, i think that's how i have connected all the dots some of them Thank very you. well very well unveiled very well unpackaged layer by layer and your last point on feminism is very close to my heart as it is to a lot of people you know the whole idea of what america is fighting today one is black lives matter and the other is rights to abortion you know making that decision which is against having an abortion so, so uh, yeah on fire right now yeah. so so thank you so much shamana you have a very steady head on young shoulders proud to be here uh, to see you speak thank you is sangeeta kishlu here Sangeeta, are you here? Nandita Chatterjee? Okay. Thank you, members. It's been wonderful. Now it's our turn to be uh, very excited about our international audience. So I have Dr. Sh Smita Kothari here. She's a specialist on Jainism. and has been teaching at Arizona State University as well as uh, Toronto she is uh, here from Toronto and she brings a modernity and contemporaneity to tradition for which she has been acclaimed and awarded a great deal so um if you're here smita can you come on in smita yes i'm here julie wonderful thank you again for waking up early oh Hi. well it's my <laughs> pleasure it it's been a very <clears throat> interesting experience to hear all this erudite scholars speaking on the book and much has been said about it so i won't focus on all the plot and all of that the novel i mean kutsi's writing is so tight so he packs so much in the novel it's merciless and at the same time compassionate so whatever you think about luri the character the writer we uh, does not could she never gets us to the stage where we hate luri that we, we there's at times we feel compassion for this 52 year old man who has been something and is now facing as many of us getting to that stage maybe feeling the aging process he might have been a casanova at one point you know be able to um captivate women maybe whatever uh but the novel explores and it hasn't been talked about so I'll just briefly talk about the notion of freedom to could see always in his novels explores these philosophical dilemmas that we face the freedom to so lori lori the dis, the word disgrace and the levels of disgrace in the novel are just so multifold so the first disgrace of course is david's own well his um seduction of melanie and and also at some level soraya whom he thinks he's in love with but it's a possession thing 
uh, follows her at home, a, a boundary he transgresses. And then he transgresses the boundary of student, the powers dynamic over there, which, which I have to say that Kurtzi doesn't say it's unusual. It's a, it's a power dynamic played over and over, we're led to believe. And of course, those of us who, many of you are in the university background, I'm sure many a young woman is seduced by um, a writer, uh, a teacher of romantic novels. There's some sort of a romance there. So Melanie in, in the beginning, is seduced and 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 is uh, you know there's a point where he says the uh, I don't know what liquor he offered her, but that was to lubricate her, and so that lubrication unfolds the seduction. It, the the freedom two point is really explored when he faces the tribunal at the university. He could his colleagues didn't want him to leave. They've seen this before, probably experienced it before. So they want him, they want to give him a way out. So the disgrace was his own. He did not want the freedom to, and he explores, Kurtzi explores that notion of the freedom to. He had a choice of just accepting the terms, make the apology, which he doesn't feel he needs to. He's arrogant. He's he's genuinely actually believing that what he's doing is the right thing. He doesn't need to apologize. And so on that principle alone, the freedom to, um, he accepts his fate and then leaves in disgrace as we're led to, to, to this outer, the, hint, the hinterland outside of the Cape Town thing to his daughter, where we find Again, the disgrace and the freedom to explore with Lucy's bodyscape, as you very well explore. It's not that uh, it's not as simplistic as Lucy does not feel the the the, the not just the disgrace, the violation, the violation of her body, but it is her choice which he very clearly states to David. It is her way of coping. And it's very complex. You know, could see doesn't make this very simple. No. So Smita, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, arrest you right here and uh, say a big thank you because this is again a unique uh, perspective. We've not come across it so far. And uh, we'll move on. Um, to thank, you, thank you, thank you, Smita. I hope you're going to be a, a you know, a, a wonderful scintillating star. Although it's an inconvenient time for you to come from Toronto and 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 give no your big deal. I'm an thank early you. riser. Thank you so much, Raka. Um, are you here, dear? I see you are here. Me? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Please go ahead and keep very tightly to the time, dear. We have. A few few people. Raka uh, Mukherjee is actually a master's uh, student, very bright. We have a whole cache of very bright uh, scholars here. So Raka, let's hear your view on um, Kuizia. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you and all the members of the Bengal Club for inviting me today. So uh, a lot of points I was planning to cover have been spoken about. But I'm going to speak about two particular quotes that uh, really made me think about, ponder about, and it involves the incident of Lucy's rape and her decision to stay back uh, in the farm. So the first quote uh, is, it happens every day, every hour, every minute, he tells himself, in every quarter of the country. Count yourself lucky to have escaped with your life. Count yourself lucky not to be a prisoner in the car at this moment, speeding away or at the bottom of the donga with a bullet in your head. Count Lucy lucky too. So this is the exact thought 
that occurs inside David's mind right at the moment he escapes and he, he just escapes with his life uh, when he was left to burn and his daughter raped by the three perpetrators. And um, as Dr. Kastogir men mentioned, I also thought about uh, Caliban's uh, attempt to rape Miranda in the Tempest. So we see that the xenophobia and the brutality in the post-apartheid uh, South African society, it's coming from years of colonial uh, oppression of the white man. And uh, the moment David comes to know that uh, Lucy is pregnant, his views change, changes. He thinks that Lucy is not lucky anymore. And he wants his daughter to get it about it, get the fetus about it. And he says that what kind of child can seed driven into the woman, not in love, but in hatred, mixed chaotically, meant to soil her, to mark her like a like dog's urine. So this line where the where the womb of Lucy is marked by the colonized, marked as a seat of, of uh, speaking back to the white supremacist uh, colonials. And this synergizes with uh, Luce Irigiri's word uh, uh, in The Speculum of the Other Woman, where she maintains that the sperm is a gift that the male father attaches to the womb of the mother and as an attempt to be reborn through her. So uh, the bodyscape of Lucy, as you mentioned, and uh, everyone uh, who spoke mentioned about, this really made me think. And then her decision to actually consider marrying Petrus for security. Here we see that for Lucy, her father is a disgrace. Her, her body being appropriated by the rapist is a disgrace but giving birth to a child, becoming a mother, is perhaps a way to ameliorate the disgrace and become the, the secure uh, coexisting member of the South African society under the security of Petrus. So I think um, from a feminist point of view, what Lucy actually did was, uh, as Luri, her father, is representing the colonizing history of the patriarchal male who himself brings upon disgrace upon himself by uh, raping uh, his, uh, having multiple sexual relations and having this affair with his uh, student where almost the act of killing is uh, compared, you know, where Lucy compares the sexual uh, tension and the sexual oppression as the act of killing. So she would rather not stay with her father and be, defy the, the white patriarchal uh, figure and stay back with Petrus with her dignity as a mother. And I think that is very fascinating that could say points, us, points uh, to us, all of us. Your, your, you insights, so your insights have been so, so perceptive. And we have enjoyed the light you've thrown on this issue of, of the bodyscape and the rape, which you have related to the theorist, Luce Rigori. Uh, Shudatta, are you here, dear? Shudatta, are you here? Shudatta, Shudatta, no. Okay, let's hear uh, Roma. Uh, Roma Bhattacharya has uh, a very distinguished career, love of literature and the arts, Oxford University, DPhil, in international development, and then senior policy advisor at UN New York. She's eminently, eminently respected and the right person to talk to us about the issues in South Africa still plaguing the population of whites and blacks today. Go for it, Roma. Thank you, Julie B and the Bengal Club for inviting me. Uh, I really can't thank you and all the speakers for the rainbow of perspectives they've brought to the novel. Uh, but I can't begin without paying my homage to the great country of South Africa, great country, fabulous landscape, wonderful people, including personal friends, and of course, a country with a telling history. Um, I have to also bow my head to Madiba Nelson Mandela, who I witnessed being honored at Oxford University. And he told us that the lawyer who was defending him and the lawyer who was prosecuting him, both were, were from Oxford. So he brought home to us the relationship between knowledge and power. 
And I think this novel takes us right to this. I'll be very brief, but it is with a kind of this ambivalence, if you like, that I approach this grace and the ambivalence has remained with me. Thoughts' towering intellect makes the writing of disgrace operate at about a hundred levels. To me, disgrace, a fall from grace, but of a modern kind. Disgrace is really a kind of exploration of the displacement of the self, social, moral, historical, and ontological. For me, an important line in the poem is the truth is, he is tired of criticism, tired of prose measured by the yard. What he wants to write is music. Given the paucity of time, what I'll do is just map what I think are some of the shifts in the self in this novel, and we can always discuss it later on. The protagonist narrator moves from an aging white Africana male academic a guardian of the culture hoard to a kind of artist where he is held in the music itself. His sense of self goes from a stoic protagonist in a Socratic trial. He says, I have reservations of a philosophic kind to a lame dog who is given up to be put down by Bev Shah. His larger worldview in the whole wretched business, there was something generous that was doing its best to flower. A single authentic note of immortal, immortal longing goes to it has dried up the source of everything. Lucy is raped by three black men happens off stage in accordance with Athenian drama. It is truly the heart of darkness in darkest Africa. However, even his self refuge as a Byronic hero slipped from grace. Like he, he writes, he stood a stranger to this breathing world. Even that space eludes him. Then his shifting self, his post-colonial identity grows from an European social imaginary. He cites Oedipus, Origen, Bovary, Byron, Wordsworth, George, Rhodes, Dante. It shifts to the little seven string banjo bought for her on the streets of Poir Massieu. He can no longer borrow from purloined songs. Finally, he cannot fit into post apartheid Africa where his new ageist lesbian daughter Lucy becomes a peasant on her erstwhile laborer Petrus's farm. For the first time, he has a taste of what it will be like to be an old man tired to the bone without hope without desires indifferent to the future and he's left as you say bleeding left out to dry a dog about to be given up to miss bev shah when that is finished he will be like a fly casing in the spider web brittle to the touch lighter than rice chaff ready to float away thank you Thank you, Roma. I can't seem to get my screen to uh, project anything. Can you all see the screen? Can you, are you able to see the screen? Yes, ma'am. I yes, can, I yes. Gurudash, my screen has gone off. Okay, never mind. We go on to the next person. Uh, and uh, I would like to call Srijita Mojumnar, um, who holds a master's in literature and an MBA in human resource management. He's currently managing the operations at HRD at Intuary, a consulting firm. So we'll get another perspective from her. Srijita, are you there? Hello, Srijita, are you there? Ma'am, Sangeeta, uh, Sangeeta ma'am has joined in. Okay, I'll call her the next person then to Dr. Ma'am also. And I have two more people. Very quickly, uh, is Srijita there? Gurudas, can you see Srijita? No, ma'am. No, no. ma'am. Okay. okay, then let's go to uh, uh, Sangeeta. Sangeeta Kichlu, the only woman tea taster I know. So she comes from the corporate world. And I'd love to hear her views. We all would. Sangeeta, are you here? 
Um, good evening, Julie. Good evening, Sangeeta. And uh, thanks for inviting me to speak, although I must say after hearing such illustrious speakers, I am really nervous because um, it was uh, really fascinating as, um, uh, you know, to get such a multi-prismatic view of, um, you know, of disgrace at so many different um, levels, so many different uh, uh, angles. And um, as I mentioned, I read this book five years ago. So a, a lot of it um, had faded from my mind. All I remember is that it was a monster of a book and it left one really battered at the end of it. And uh, the battering came from the power of um, the author's writing, you know? And um, I, I don't want to say too much because so much has been said so well, but um, I think this book is all about, and like, it's all about atonement. It's atonement by Lurie as well as Lucy. Um, uh, Lurie, because he could have also um, allowed himself to be tried, but he chose to, um, to uh, you know, leave everything and go into the farm um, and go into the land, into, into the black land. So I think he, he went uh, basically uh, for atonement. And Lucy was also um, atoning herself for all the, for the generations that have passed. So that, that is the summary of what I um, sort of, you know, think of this book. Um, I don't want to say any more because I think most of the ground has been covered very beautifully. Thank you so much, Sangeeta. That is a very comprehensive summary of the most salient points. Um, may I move on to um, Nayab? Nayab, are you here? Nayab, are you here? Okay, Moitri, Moitri Chakraborty. She is a, a master's in English literature and has done a lot of uh, research on Koitsia. So uh, I would love to hear what she has to say. Moitri, are you there? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Can you hear me? Lovely. Lovely, go ahead. I would like to thank everybody present here because they have opened different windows for me. They have opened different perspectives to look at Koitsia and to look at disgrace essentially. So I would just comprehensive look at certain paragraphs. The woman is continuously obliged to seek survival or advancement through the approval of males as those who hold power like that of Petrius, who should take her under his wing. Lucy acknowledges Petrius's proposal. She understands that Petrius is offering an alliance in return of which she should be allowed to creep under his wings for protection, for survival. Innumerable years of patriarchal history and the internalization of its culture has devastated in effect on the woman's self-image. Lucy's image of her own self has shattered. Essentially, as a raped woman, she is deprived of even the most trivial source of dignity. Lucy not only gives Petrius her land, the coveted dowry, but also the authority to weave a story about their relationship as and how he pleases or wants to, like that of his wife, third wife, or his mistress. Time and again, we see David tries to be there for Lucy and guide Lucy to what David believes is the right track. Even though David believes he was there with Lucy, he wasn't actually there. He was not in the position of Lucy when her body was being forcefully marked, violated, and claimed as an uncharted territory, her womb soiled, and the seed of hatred planted within her. Thus, it is Lucy and only she who can take the decision. The decision of trying to find protection in Petrus, a man who is native of the land. Thus, with a child growing within her, she is trying to accept and learn to live a life with no cards, no weapons, no rights, no dignity, as David calls it, like a dog. And she accepts herself like a dog, but she has the authority of her own life for a change. And that's all. Ma'am, you need to unmute yourself, please. Julie, ma'am, you need to unmute yourself, please.
we need to wait for some time because uh, Julie Ma'am is out of the grid. Hi there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're on the yeah, grid right now. My computer went off, so I'm using uh, Professor Mehta's phone. Okay, so um, the next speaker, Gurudash, is going to take another five, seven minutes. Is that okay? Absolutely. Absolutely, Thank you so much, Gurudash. Take your time. Um, thank you. Um, I'm looking for Roshni. Are you there? Uh, yes, ma'am. Good evening. Okay, Roshni. So let's hear you. Yeah, thank you, Julie, ma'am, for giving thank me this you. opportunity. Uh, apologies you. for not keeping my camera on today because it's not working. I have That's a dysfunctional okay. laptop as well. So uh, I'm quite intimidated by um, the perspectives that have uh, come forth, I mean, uh, in the past 1.5 hours. Thanks. And I am still reading the novel and I have reached up to a level where I can speak about um, certain characters. Um, I have been a little shook uh, by reading this particular novel because uh, I haven't confronted uh, the level of violence which I have in this book in any other book. So uh, there are a few points which I just want to uh, talk about is that uh, the first thing which really struck me as uh, Professor Dr. Dasgupta mentioned about uh, possession of the land in the beginning there's a clear uh, dialogue by uh, David Lurie where he says Cape Town, a city of prodigal beauty of beauties. So uh, the possession and the male gaze of the land of the exotic. So he compares, uh, he takes hold of the woman's body and of the land he lives in. So uh, as you had uh, taught us, ma'am, in class about the concept of double colonization of the land as well as of the woman's body, it continuously rings throughout the book. There is another thing which I want to mention. It is about the newly independent states. The groups of liberation, I can say, becomes unevenly distributed, very selectively distributed. And uh, it doesn't really bring about a lot of change, uh, changes in the status of women. Uh, why I am saying is this because uh, Lucy, uh, a white woman, her decision to report the sexual aggression by uh, the colored men of um, uh, the colored neighbors, if I can say, would seem to be like a fraught decision. I'm still at a very contested position because a woman is a woman whether she is colored, whether she is white, or whether she is brown. So her decision to not take uh, the issue of her rape ahead, and uh, it seems like she carries an awareness of a looming danger which might affect her in the future. This very thin line of the difference between the self and the other gradually diminishes as we continue to read the novel. That is what I've observed. So, um, and I've always believed that the notions of class, sexuality, gender, it always begets the margin and the other. It automatically happens as we read through the novel. So, ma'am, this is what I wanted to yeah, say. Yeah, I think that's, that, that, that's a, uh, you know, that, that's again a very unique uh, way of looking at it, that it doesn't matter if you look at the issue of uh, appropriation and rape of the woman's body, it doesn't really matter whether you're brown or black or white. The, the way that the response comes from institutions uh, run by patriarchy uh, is always uh, desecratory, it is uh, demoralizing, it is disempowering to women. Very good point, uh, Roshni. Radhika Mukherjee, are you here? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Good evening, Radhika, sweetheart, sorry, it's been so late, but we've had such a rich set of pickings. It's a little late.
keep it short keep it focused as you always do let's have your view and then i'll move on to shebonti ma'am firstly i'd like to thank you so much for having me on board this evening it has been illuminating to listen to all the members out here i mean uh, i was i am at a loss of words to be honest where to start from um, we are honored to as, have you we are honored to have you thank you ma'am uh, as most of the salient points have been covered by the speakers here i just like to uh, point out uh, that uh, when we trace down the different levels of disgrace in the novel uh, i think uh, i look at the dog as a uh, the dogs rather as a very powerful symbol and in a way i find the dogs have also been disgraced in the in the uh, horrific manner in which they had been gunned down by the strangers yes. when they vandalized the land the woman's body uh, so right at the end of the novel when i see uh, if we look at uh, david's character it's as if he is in this existential angst because there is nothing more that he can hold on to so he mourns the death of these uh, dogs and uh, just as the uh, just as he tries to find the veins so that they can be euthanized and relieved from their suffering it's as though there's a part of him that is dwindling into isolation Absolutely. and uh, it's as if he's being drawn uh, he being the white man in the on the african soil the the role of the colonizer and the colonized is is getting reversed and he is as though being a tethered from all his relations and he's stuck into this vacuum and it's as though this sociological and psychological alienation which he cannot really return from and there is no redemption from that so what keeps there's a question which keeps lingering on my mind that whether it is divine vengeance or whether it is fate but whatever it is it has been a most powerful and horrifying read so far so um that's all i want to say absolutely radhika no easy answers and i love your um pointing out to the animal imagery which we haven't really talked about enough which we will in our own discussions later but absolutely brilliant um explication thank you so very much shivanti we will be ending with you so i would like a different opinion which i'm sure you will give us shivanti go ahead shivanti shivanti shengupto is our very dear uh, librarian she's been with the bengal club for 18 years i believe that's nearly two decades almost the same time as this novel was written by koizia um and she is a masters in library science from calcutta university really honored to have you uh, with us shivanti go ahead Good give evening, us your opinion many thanks for letting me the opportunity to speak in this uh, evening session ma'am i have a very different view point i think from the rest of the speakers who have spoken so far uh, at the very beginning to be extremely candid had the impression that the novel was a very difficult read and uh, i was not really feeling comfortable to move on with it uh, i don't know whether it would be correct on my part to call it um, a little bit dark i felt the novel is a little bit dark since it it was it deals with a lot of violence and um, i found a lot of negative elements as well but uh, as dr parmika mukherjee has very rightly pointed out that uh, there is a perfect juxtaposition of both positive and negative elements into uh, in this particular book and uh, i i personally feel that this is the mark of a great author who has the potential to bring in uh, all the different elements of a particular human character not only that he is emphasizing on the dark and the gloomy parts of a uh, human uh, of in nature but then he is bringing in Lots of positive elements as well, and they are like the mark of a 
Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for uh, participating in this lively uh, event. And we, I do hope that we continue with the same zeal and enthusiasm in the days to come. Thank you, Shebonti. Thank you, everybody. Um, next time, I will make sure that we manage our time better because we've had lots of viewpoints and lots of richness here. I'm so grateful. On behalf of the Library Subcommittee of the Bengal Club, it is a great pleasure to have had this evening with you. Thank you, everyone. And see you again for the next uh, book, which I will keep uh, everyone informed about. Thank you again. Thank you, thank and you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so, so much, much Julie. Julie. Thank you so much, Thank you, Julie. Wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Julie. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Julie, ma'am. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Very kind of you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. We'll plan our next homework very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good Thank, night. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. 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 Thank